Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to our online friends. Hello, it's nice to see you. Any online guests? Hi, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Kelly. Uh, I have the wonderful privilege to be married to Pastor Doug. Um, you know, that's just special for me. <laughs> um, but I'm also um, running the children's and youth program right now, doing a little bit of worship, doing a little bit of this and that. Um, so if you ever come down, you'll see me wearing all those hats. Um, but we would love to meet you. But if we can't, we will meet you online. So here's a virtual handshake and a virtual hug for all of you online. Um, just have a few quick announcements this morning. Um, this Saturday, um, August 29th at 2 p.m. Everybody say 2 p.m. 2 p.m. at Pastor Doug's house. We're going to eat and we're going to have fun. That's right. We're going to eat and have fun. Um, two o'clock, our house uh, f uh, is our church picnic. For those of you um, who need the address, I have put it on the back sign-up sheet, so make sure you take a picture of it. Um, remember, if you're coming, you're bringing a side or a dessert. Um, there's still time to sign up, so we would love to have you if you haven't signed up yet. Sign up on the sign-up sheet, because by the end of service, I'm taking it with me, so I know who's bringing what. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so sign up today. Um, last day, obviously, to do it. Um, and just come on down. We're just going to have fun. We're going to hang out. Um, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Burgers, dogs, turkey burgers. It's going to be It's gonna be good. Um, then also coming up in two weeks. Say two weeks. See, I'm getting my teacher voice in, y'all. Say two weeks. There we go. In two weeks, Wednesday night Bible study will start back up online. Um, so there will be more details on the website, but just keep in mind the first Wednesday in November, we will start back up with online Bible study on Wednesday nights at 6.30 September. Yes, first Wednesday in September. So that's literally, that's two weeks. So two weeks with all that. That said, our kids can be dismissed and Pastor Doug is going to come. Howdy, y'all. It is good to see y'all. It is good to be here. Claire, can you unblack my slides? Thanks. Awesome. Cool. If I haven't met you, my name is Doug. I'm the lead pastor here. It's so good to see all of y'all. It's good to have you with us online. Uh, it's good to see all of our kids get heading downstairs. They're going to have a blast today. Yeah, give our kids a hand. Woo, woo, woo. Awesome. <laughs> cool. Oops, let me switch. There we go. Awesome. So we are continuing. Oh, actually, before we jump into the message. So just want to reiterate, come this Saturday. It's going to be a blast. It's come as you are. Come and go as you please. So we'll be there two to six. There will be food two to six. Can't make any promises after that. Uh, but all we're going to do is food and fun. That is the entire agenda. So we'll have plenty of food. And as long as you bring the fun, no, I'm kidding. We'll have plenty of fun too. So, but we are continuing our series called Tribe today. Uh, this past uh, week, uh, I was caught off guard. Uh, Kelly was trying to get me somewhere on the roads. Uh, and sometimes she doesn't like to use Google Maps and she just likes to tell me where. I do not handle that well in my brain. Like I need to have that kind of like up-to-date direction. And it hit me that there's a question I always struggle with. So she told me, that the place we're going is two miles from where we're from. And to me, that means nothing. Oh wait, I just realized, I'm on mute, there we go. Sorry, live stream, that was my bad. Uh, sorry, live stream, welcome, hi, I was on mute that entire time, I apologize. Um, so yeah, but the, it hit me. The que she'd said, the place we're going is two miles from where we're from. And I thought, that doesn't mean anything to me Tell me how much time it'll take to get there. So I have a question. Do you measure distance from point A to point B in miles or time? Raise your hand if you're a miles person. Raise your hand if you're a time person. Oh, wow, that's so funny. Okay. James, by yourself. Hey, good on you, miles person. I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> 
I guess it depends too on like how far you're going and like what kind of trip you're taking. And it made me think because it hit my ADHD brain and it made me think of weird measures of distance. So all of these are real. All of these are used in various ways. Um, and, t and just raise your hand if you've ever used one of these. A jiffy. Anyone ever say, hey, I'll be there in a jiffy? Uh, okay. So a jiffy is, comes from computing. One jiffy is the duration of one tick of the system timer interrupt. This is usually 0.01 seconds. So how many of us have ever said that? I know I've said it. We've all been lying. It's okay. Um, a shake. Anyone ever say, I'll be there in a shake? In nuclear, well, that's just it. In nuclear engineering and astrophysics, a shake, which comes from two shakes of a lamb's tail, um, it's defined as 10 nanoseconds. Who knew? A barn megaparsec. How many ever said that? Oh yeah, the pie will be done baking in 10 barn megaparsecs, right? A barn megaparsec is approximately two thirds of a teaspoon. It, it's a combination of the unit barn, which is a tiny area used in nuclear physics, and the megaparsec, a very large unit used for measuring distance between galaxies. Who knew? And that's a teaspoon. How many of you think, I think of space every time I use my teaspoon? Anyone? A sheppy. A sheppy is defined as the closest distance at which sheep remain picturesque, which is about seven-eighths of a mile. So if you're far away from sheep, uh, my wife had a, uh, a school event yesterday and they had a petting zoo. And so uh, we got to see sheep up close and got to pet them. Uh, the one staff member gave Emily a giant bowl of food to feed all of the animals there. And I kid you not, that sheep took the bowl out of her hand, flipped it underneath him, dumped the whole thing out, like threw the plate back. It was a miracle. But anyone ever use a sheppy? Because sheep are not that pretty close up, right? Uh, they're just utilitarian, but far away, they look nice. How about a beard second? Anyone? A unit inspired by the light year, but for extremely short distances. A beard second is defined as the length an average physicist's beard grows in a second, about five nanometers. Why would you ever use this on your day-to-day, -day, right? Like, have you ever told, like, have you ever talked to, like, the Starbucks barista and say, how many beard seconds will that be? because then you have to do like math and nanosecond math in your head. It's just not that effective. So today I say all of that because measurement can get confusing and can get really, really, really messy. And especially when we think about how crazy life can be and how messed up things can get is that sometimes even in our Christian walk, we do not know how we're measuring ourselves against what Christ has laid out for us. So today we're going to talk about being people of duty. We're going to continue through the book of uh, the later half of the book of Romans. Uh, last week we got to talk about uh, being people of submission that were submitted to the law, which I will tell you, I had people in the congregation online say, hey, I am changing X because of that message. And that's so encouraging to me because A, I, I always like to hear that as a pastor, but B, messages like that, I'm always like, this is a weird one. Everyone's going to leave discouraged and be like, now I've got to watch out for the cops. You still do have to watch out for the cops. But it's always good to hear like the practical ways that Christ is changing us. This is another one of those. Because Paul, as he walks us through uh, Romans chapter 13, he starts with this whole section on the law. He says, hey, submit to those in authority. Listen to those who are there because they're there ultimately for your good. And again, remember, we talked about the difference between submission and obedience, that we're submitted to them, but our ultimate allegiance lies with Christ. That's just the reality. Next week, I'll tell you why I'm skipping over this week. Next week, we're going to talk about what it means to be holy and what it means to walk in, in obedience and submission to Christ. This week, we're going to talk about love. And if we see last week's message as the lettuce on our sandwich, and next week's message as the tomato, this week is the bacon on our BLT. It's what pulls all of this together, is what makes the submission to authority make sense. It's what takes all of the weird measurements that we measure ourselves against in the Christian life and say, I know I've got one line that I'm measuring against. And even when we talk about holiness next week, 
Holiness being a fancy term for being solely like Christ. A lot of times, that can become one of these things that we measure ourselves against, where we say, I, you know, I, like the old saying goes, I haven't hung with girls who smoke or chew, who, you know, or I always mess this up. I haven't smoke or chew or hang with girls who do. That's what my mom always used to tell me, always avoid that. And I'm just like, okay, so I've got a checklist of three things. Cool. And they're easy checkboxes, right? But when the checkboxes become all that our life is measured against, we miss the point right? You know, if like we just measure how much of, of life we want to say, I did good. I am a good person. Being a good person is a good thing. Very highly rated. Be a good person, but it's incomplete. And that's why Paul kind of puts this right in the middle. So we're going to read through this today in Romans chapter 13. Our big idea today is that love is our default. When everything goes crazy inside of your computer, this is one of the things I love about like programming, is that pr computers do what you tell them to do. So if there's a mistake in there, it's more than likely because you've told them the wrong thing to do. And so what you do, the, there's one rule, well, there's a bunch of rules, but one of the great rules in computer programming is that you never trust a user. Users are people. I am people. And I know I make mistakes. So you always make sure that when somebody's putting in something into a computer, that there are defaults to fall back to. That if somebody's going to put in a password of password, first of all, don't do that. Don't use password as your password. But most times, your computer will say, listen, your password's not strong enough. Why? It has a default setting. It says, it's got a bar that I want you to reach. Just include a number and like a symbol. And then you include a, a number and a symbol and it says, I'm happy now. Great. Defaults are a really easy way to say, I know that if nothing else above this is working, I'm landing on X. I know I'm landing on this one thing. And for us as Christians, that one thing is love. And so we're going to read Romans chapter 13. Verses 8 through 10, we're just taking a tiny little portion of Scripture here, and then we're going to talk through it. But it says this, Do not owe anyone anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and any other commandment are summed up by this commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, uh, love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for your great love that you have for us. God, the love that we sang about this morning, that we, uh, we poured out our hearts before you. God, we experienced that love. Lord, I pray as we dig into your word today that we might continue to be changed by your love and that we might continue to exhibit that love in everything we do as your family, as the people of God gathered together. Lord, as the people of God scattered in this world, Lord, help us to show that love. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. All right. I love this portion of scripture because it just follows such a great logical pattern. And I'm a very logical person. So the first thing that we see is that love compounds with interest. Do not owe anyone anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. You know, we spent a lot of time last week talking about like how Paul is saying like, yeah, like pay your taxes. It's a very basic kind of thing, very like bland kind of thing. Not something anyone gets excited about and says, yeah, I'm going to go pay my taxes. Woo! Party. Should we put on some party music right now? And like have a part, yeah, let's do it. Let's, no, I'm just kidding. Don't stand to your feet. You know, it's not the kind of thing that we get super excited about. But Paul ends that portion of scripture that we read last week with saying, let there be no debt. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If you owe honor, pay honor. If you owe respect, pay respect. And he says here, the only debt that you and I remain outstanding is the debt of love that the only thing that you and I 
continually owe to one another is love. Because every time we pay that debt, there's been interest that's been made. You know, did you ever get back? I remember when we were um, paying our student loans, thankfully, we got student loans paid off um, uh, a a couple years ago. Thank you, Jesus. But the thing that always struck me was how much of the loan I paid, that wasn't money I received. It was interest. It was money that they said, we'll loan you this at this much amount coming back to us. And I'm just like, well, wait a minute. You know, me and my pre-college years, I was not a smart kid going to college. But I remember thinking, well, that doesn't seem fair. Why am I giving you more money than you were giving me? And finally, when I paid it off, I was like, you know, you hit that button on the computer to make that final payment. And Sally May, the loan provider, does this really neat thing where it says, it it doesn't give you a fancy, like, picture. It doesn't give you anything celebratory. It gives you a black box that says, your loan is paid off, your account's been deleted. That's it. There's no celebration. There's nobody there saying, you have done the impossible. There's no fanfare and there's nothing. And I remember thinking at that moment, feeling so vindicated, but so let down. Love is not like that. Love continually stacks and there's continual interest. There's always that opportunity to give more. There's always the opportunity to share more and more love. I remember when, uh, when we had gotten pregnant with Emily and thinking to myself that the amount of love that I have to share as a parent is maxed out. I'm giving all of my love to this one kid. How in the world is it possible that I'm going to love two? And then all of a sudden, seeing her born, it was like the container grew. And I'm just like, you know, like when your credit card comes back and they says they raised your, they raised your rate or they raised the amount that you can spend. I'm like, I have more love to give. Now I'm not just giving 50-50. I'm not spreading it out. I'm giving 100-100 here. And loving my wife on top of it. I get to love this lady who got up here and sang. That's amazing. That's what love does as we continue to use it, as we continue to experience God's love that we, it grows inside of us. It's like an investment you just let sit there and you use it and the interest continually comes out and it makes you more and all of a sudden you've got more room for it. Paul is saying, listen, you have leave no debt outstanding except the debt that you have to be able to love one another because every time, that's what's great about like being a part of a church is like, look around you. There are, so, there are empty seats in here. For every empty seat is another person that can come in and that we can say, hey, I love you. Full stop. There's no like, there's no qualifiers on there. You're here. Our heart container just grew. Hey, two more came. Hey, we love you too. We're so glad you're here. Your heart container grows over and over again that God does that work inside of our hearts. It compounds. Next, let's talk about how love checks the boxes. Verse 9 says, The commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and any other commandment are summed up by this commandment love your neighbors yourself. We see Jesus saying this same kind of thing, but basically, if you've ever thought, And if you've ever been in one of those spots where walking the Christian life feels like checking the boxes, I know I talk about this a lot, but I'll tell you why I talk about it a lot. Is I've seen what we call legalism, this this idea that we earn our way to Christ, we earn our way to God by being good, good kids. I often think that comes from a really deep wound in us, you know, where a father didn't say, hey, I'm proud of you until you did the right thing or I love you until you did the right thing. Anyway, there's theory on that. But a lot of times we look at Christ and we say, he loves me because I do X. That's what we call legalism. And it's a great evil. Because Jesus loves you, full stop. There's no qualifiers to that. 
He's not ever looking at you and saying, I love you, but. Because you know what's funny about the word but? Nothing counts before it. You did a great job, but. Okay, we get it. You wanted to say the but part, but you wanted to make it feel good. This is why things like the old corporate sandwich method always feel so terrible to you. You always walk away feeling like you've eaten a sandwich that's been sitting in the fridge for two weeks. You know the meat's just a little bit moldy. You know that like it's, it, it smells just a little bit funky because the bread of praise is on there. Hey, you've been great at what you've done. But that meat of the pain is coming. But let's talk about your performance here. Okay, we get it. You wanted to talk about the performance. Anyway, we can talk about, we can talk about middle management all day. But a lot of times we live our Christian life like that. Or we experienced our Christian life like that. You know, where people would say, they would look at us and say, Okay, I just got this new phone in. It won't stay on for me. The commandments. Jesus loves you, but are you committing adultery? Jesus loves you, but do you harbor hate and murder in your heart? Jesus loves you, but this. And Paul is saying, no, listen, like all of these things are wrapped up in the commandment of love your neighbors yourself. So then our call becomes not just checking boxes, but checking just the one box. Am I loving my neighbor as myself? Am I loving my neighbor as I love myself? And now one of these things that we need to know about this passage here is that this automatically assumes you love yourself. You automatically fall. Now listen, we all struggle with kind of like feelings of like low self-esteem and that kind of thing. We go through those seasons. There's still a tacit understanding that you and I work in a way that we preserve ourselves. We work in a way that, you know, honors ourself. We often think of ourselves in a, in a, you know, a self-centered way, not necessarily in a negative way, though it can be, but we've got ourselves on our mind because we're the person that we truly know from the inside out, right? And so Paul here is laying out and saying, all of these other things will fall into love your neighbor as yourself. It checks all of the boxes instantaneously. I remember when I was in seventh grade, I had a teacher who got so sick and tired of, of the kids in the class. I, see, I separated myself there. I was also a kid in the class, and I was probably guilty of this. But we were so loud and so obnoxious that one day he said he would give us a quiz. And he gave us this quiz and he said, you have five minutes to complete these 20 questions. You must read every instruction on this page before you even lift your pen. And you have to get this done in five minutes. If you're not done in five minutes, you failed for this week. And so all of us, we're all of a sudden panicking. And so what's the first thing that you do when you panic? You skip reading the instructions. And so none of us read the instructions. We're like, we know quizzes. We know what we're doing. Okay, we got to go. We got to go. So the very first thing on there is you write your name up at the top of the test. The second thing is you stand from your seat and you spin around twice. The third thing is that you write, you know, this complex math problem. It wasn't anything crazy, but it was something that would take you like a couple seconds to figure out. The fourth thing is that you stood on top of your chair and you would say, I am completing the assignment according to all the rules and all the instructions on the page. The fifth question was this other, and it was over and over and over until finally I got to like question 12. And we're like three and a half minutes in. And I look over at my friends who are smarter than me. And I'm like, why are they smiling? Why are their pencils down? And all of a sudden, what did I do? I remembered. If you read the instructions, the instructions said, read every question on the quiz before you, t before you do any. Question 20 was say, skip all the other questions and just write your name on the top of the paper. And so part of me was really mad because I was already a couple steps in and I'm already trying to like erase like things that are on the paper. But 
it was a lesson in like learning instructions and that kind of thing and you know ultimately but I say all of that because if I had just checked the one box I would have checked them all and I would have actually passed the quiz now he didn't fail us he was more just trying to say like stop being jerks kids okay I get it um and I'm grateful for that lesson because now I get to use it as a sermon illustration but if I would have just checked the one box I would have been fine with all the others and this is where this idea of default comes. If at any point you have a question about where your faith is going, land on the one thing you know you can't do. Love your neighbors yourself. If at any time something becomes confusing, you don't know necessarily, it's really easy to say, hey, I haven't murdered anyone today, but we look at passages of scripture where Jesus said, well, have you ever like cursed your neighbor under your breath? You got the little steam under the collar there. Jesus says that and you're like, oh. And then in those moments, we're often used to saying, I know the easy rule because it's easy to remember. Have you stolen anything today? Not that I'm aware of. But if it gets to that spot where you're not sure what to do next, you just fall to the default. Am I loving my neighbor as myself? You know, we live in a very, very complex world. You know, for the first time in at least our recorded history, we're able to get information in real time. We're able to be inundated with uh, constant sources of news and social media and information coming at us at a blast, like, like getting like a super soaker to the face. Does not feel good. And, and you're just like, oh, it's too much. It's too much. There are moments where you look at that and you're like, I don't know what to do with that, right? Like we heard this week about the, you know, the terrible tragedy in Hawaii, you know, and, and the, you know, an entire island basically burned to the ground, you know, we hear of, of constant like, political strife, the wildfires up in, in uh, the Northwest Territories in Canada. You know, we hear about the, the things happening in our own community, about, you know, where are all the businesses, or who's getting shot today, or, you know, what happened over at True Diamond this past week, you know, where now they're keeping open, and it's just like, so what do I do with all of that? You're getting to the point where it's like, it, you know, if I had hair, I'd try and pull it out. I can't even get like a little bit, but like I'd be pulling it out because I'm like, Lord, what do you do? When you get to those moments, default to love. Just default to loving your neighbors yourself. And if you can ask that one question and say, yeah, okay, it gives clarity. There's so much clarity that comes from a simple question like this of saying, am I loving this person as I want to be loved? It becomes a really, really radical thing. Let's keep going here. Love completes the law. Verse 10, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. If we go back to verse 9, everything really hinges on this, that since our one thing that we're defaulting to is love your neighbor as yourself, it's the linchpin. It's the very thing in the middle of all of this. If you have a question about something in the Old Testament and, and, and like that initial law where Moses laid out 600 and some laws for the people of God to follow, he was setting up a political society. He was setting up a society that was meant to govern and that kind of thing. So sometimes we can look at it and say, does God still want me not to wear a poly cotton blend? It's in there. And it can become even more and more confusing. But if we look at what Paul says here, and what Jesus is even, all Paul is doing is really referencing back to Jesus, where Jesus would look at the, at the people and say, listen, you've got two. Love, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and your strength. And the second is like that. That Jesus is equivocating almost the two. Not saying that we should love people more than God, but he's saying, listen, if you're loving the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength, then loving your neighbor as yourself is the logical default that we go to. 
Because that's the kind of work that Christ wants to do in our hearts. He saves us to learn to love like he loves, to experience the love of God, and to let others experience that love through us. You know, he tells the story, or, or, or we hear the story from Scripture, the rich young ruler. That person who said, yeah, I, Lord, I'm a great guy. Let me follow you. And he said, or, or, or what, what's the, or, I'm sorry, I'm getting my stories mixed up. You know, there's the lawyer who comes up and says, what's the greatest commandment? Okay, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. Everything hinges on this. And that's what Paul is quoting for us today too. Because everything that's been in the law prior to that, everything that we can be doing as, as Christ followers, everything we can be doing to love the family of God together, hinges on this idea that everything falls into these two categories. Am I loving God? Am I loving my neighbor? Am I loving God? Am I loving my neighbor? So listen, what does this mean for us today? I was really moved this morning. I had to, uh, so I've been running this Facebook group uh, for quite a while uh, called Founding Kensington, which is, so I don't go on social media a lot just because it's not great for my mental health some days. <laughs> and so let's be honest. Um, and so uh, I got contacted a couple months ago by, uh, by a newspaper, I forget who it was, and they said, hey, your group is really helping people. Founding Kensington was formed. Uh, Kensington's an open air drug market. Lots of people go out there and they, uh, it's literally called like the Disneyland of heroin. And so like they go out there highly impacted by the opioid crisis. You can get super cheap uh, drugs there. Open air market. So like the cops will be there on the corner and you can completely sell in front of them. You got people like just in the worst circumstances and people get lost down there from all over the country. And so created that Facebook group uh, to become that. And, you know, I kind of like, not let it lapse, but like didn't do a lot of promotion for it. And then the newspaper called me and, and they're like, yeah, you have like 30,000 members on there. And I'm just like, how, how many? Like, th okay, cool. And so, uh, but this morning I had just dropped a message on there. And uh, because I need to move out of that, I'm no longer in Kensington. I'm here in, in uh, McKee's Rocks. And so... But the very first comment on there was from a guy we administered to under there. And like, just catching up, and like, if I'm honest, I thought he died. And so I, I was just so moved that like, I'm upstairs in the office on Facebook, on my computer, like, trying hard not to weep, not that anyone's watching. And I'm just sitting there like, Lord, thank you. Thank you. Because, A, his love for me, because he was checking on me, moved my heart, but just seeing how God loved him and got him to a place where he's now clean. He, he's been clean for a while now, and I'm like, Lord, you can do it. You moved in his heart. You've changed his life, and that's awesome. And that's the power of that neighborly love, because it starts with us just bridging that gap. Being that bridge between person A and person B so that Christ can take a journey to person B. So I want to challenge us today as we look just, not just at the tribe who's here, not just at the family of God that meets uh, at the corner of Ninth and Broadway, but as we look at, at the global church, as we look at those who are celebrating Jesus around us, as we look at future family members who are here in our community, people who may still be sleeping now. That's okay, that's why we have a live stream. People are going to, to be, be met, uh, you know, in a couple months. Uh, in, in, l let me, I'll fill you in. Next month, we're going to start a new series called Won't You Be My Neighbor? I stole that line. It did start here in Pittsburgh, so we can kind of claim it as our own, right? Probably not legally or ethically, but we'll still do it. Um, but we're doing a series called Won't You Be My Neighbor, and we're going to do something called Neighbor Day where we go out and we just see how many people we can serve in a day. We're going to use creativity. We're going to do it like in a really fun way. In October, we're going to do our Halloween outreach again, where we just give out candy. 
and we just tell people, hey, we love you, we're open, you know, we're here for you, we're here to serve. In, in, in November, we're gonna have our Thanksgiving lunch after, after uh, the, the Sunday right before Thanksgiving. What a great time to say, hey, we're here, come get food. Do you like food, yes or no? Circle one. If you circled yes, this is gonna be a good place to be. We're gonna do those kind of things as a church because it's a really easy way for us to say, we love you. We love you as, as Jesus loves you. We love you as I am loved. We love you as I love myself. I'm gonna go right after this and I'm gonna feed myself. I wanna share that same joy with you. I've been talking about BLTs in this sermon for a long time. We need to, we need to work on that, right? So we're gonna do that as a church, but I wanna challenge us too. Because those are events. Events are good. But right after this, you're going to leave here. And you're going to be met with people who are going to put that scripture to the test. What a great way to say, I'm going to love you as my neighbor. I'm going to love you the way Jesus loves you. Oh, I'm going to love you as I love myself. Because Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. I'm just going to love like crazy. I want to challenge you to do that this week. Some, somebody is going to come into your life. It's going to be a coworker. It's going to be a family member. It's going to be uh, somebody working up at the Giant Eagle. It's going to be somebody at Starbucks. It's going to be somebody at the gas station. It's going to be somebody over here panhandling on the bridge. It's going to be one of those circumstances you're going to be like, oh, this is the moment that they were talking about. God's going to put somebody in your life that needs that love that has not experienced that love today. And I'm gonna challenge you to love. And I would love for you to share your story after that because God is gonna use you in mighty ways. But I wanna challenge you to give yourself to that, to be ready for those divine interruptions this week. Whether that interruption is something that you had, you had planned, hey, a family member just kind of drops a secret on you, ooh, how do you handle that? Love your neighbors yourself family member from the family of God calls you up and says, hey, I'm in trouble. Love your neighbors yourself. You meet that stranger and they're just in need of a loving hand. Love your neighbors yourself. I challenge you this week and I want to, see, I want to hear the stories. I'm excited for it. But let me pray for us and then uh, we'll be on our way to put, this, uh, to put uh, feet to our faith today. Father, we love you. God, we thank you so much today that you love us dearly. Lord, I pray as we go from this place that you'll help us to put our faith into practice today, to love our neighbor as ourselves, God, to work radically in our faith to say we love you. God, to love in a way that is as scandalous as you loving us. God, that as your word says that while we were still enemies of God, you loved us. God, the kind of love we see in Jesus, who when the rich young ruler came, Jesus called him to follow, to leave it all behind, to leave the checklist behind, and to leave his possessions behind, and to follow in love. God, that when in John 8, when the Pharisees brought the woman before him, caught in adultery and threw him at his feet to be stoned, Jesus said, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Help us to love like that. Lord, help us to, to love with your radical love in everything that we say and do today. Lord, we love you and give you thanks for all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. May God bless you as you go as we love our neighbors around us. Have a great week.